Thank you to all. Um, uh, just a terrific, terrific evening. It's such a pleasure and an honor to be with all of you. And um, I'd like to say a few thanks, of course, to our award recipients, uh, Jane and Mark Nathanson. Congratulations. Uh, to our event co-chairs, uh, Bill Resnick, Michael Stubbs, and of course, Laura and Gary Lauder. Thank you so much. Uh, our board chair, Jim Crown, uh, the, the greatest supporter of the Aspen Institute. Thank you so much, Jim, for all you do. There are a lot of people who worked hard to make this possible. Uh, can I ask all first if you could join in thanking all those who prepared our meal and served our meal this evening? Now, the other thing is, of course, we've had um, a pretty difficult couple days um, with the fire, fires, I should say, um, in uh, Down Valley. And the, both the Aspen Institute team and the Aspen Meadows team have really worked hard to try to make uh, this gathering and the other gatherings we're having go smoothly. Uh, many different colleagues have worked longer hours than normal preparing for all sorts of contingencies. I know that some of the travel for some of you may, was more difficult than you would have liked, uh, but there was a team here just so committed to making it as convenient for all as possible. And so I hope you could join me in thanking Cordell Carter, uh, Luis Renta, <laughs> Natasha Little, Desiree Bibi. And, and just with that, it's worth remembering that the, the, the fires are still going on. It seems that things are moving in a good direction. 30% uh, containment or something. There's been no injuries um, so far. I, we hope none. Um, one of the things that did happen, though, is a lot of our employees at both the Aspen Institute and at the Aspen Meadows had to be relocated. And so many have not gone back yet to their homes. And there's going to be a, you know, a whole sort of community-wide effort to, to participate in supporting those families and to eventually working on the cleanup. Uh, yesterday, the Aspen Institute made a, a sizable donation uh, to the Community Foundation to help get that started. And I think it really matters that all of us if find some way, somehow, to pitch in. Uh, there's also um, uh, some, some you know, great people here just sitting amongst us, which is pretty cool, besides Sue. Um, I think it's amazing that we have uh, an Associate Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court with us. Uh, uh, I, I can't name everybody, but I, I think it's worth noting that we have Ambassador Dennis Ross here, who has worked for peace in the Middle East his entire career. And it's, uh, it's pretty cool that, uh, uh, that uh, Justice Breyer was interviewed by Joshua Johnson earlier today. Joshua Johnson has succeeded Diane Rehm. And this, uh, uh, I think I know a little bit what it's like to succeed a legend. Uh, <laughs> so we, we're going to share notes later. But thank you so much for flying out and helping uh, today. Um, OK, so now we, here we are with one of the most impressive leaders in our country, right here in our midst. I'm going to take a moment and make you blush, I realize. Um, but Sue Desmond Hellman has played a major role in so many different endeavors that have improved the quality of life. Um, among many different uh, leadership roles she's held, of course, she's currently the CEO of the Bill and Linda Gates Foundation, has been in that role since 2014. Before that, she was chancellor of uh, University of California, San Francisco, a legendary, extraordinary institution. Um, and just from looking at some of the numbers, the fundraising that you did during that time to advance the human condition, uh, the, the advances you led in, in research, just amazing. Um, before that, the chief medical officer and president of a biotech firm, uh, Genentech, where she developed two of the first gene-targeted therapies for cancer. I may ask you a question or two about that. Um, I hope you do. Yes, it helped, <laughs> helped everybody in this room. Uh, we all know and love somebody uh, who's dealing with that horrible uh, disease. Um, Forbes named her one of the seven most powerful innovators in 2009. That was, that was eight years ago. Look at all you've done since then. Um, and Fortune named her one of the top 50 most powerful women in business. Um, She's joined tonight by her husband, uh, Nicholas Hellman, who's a leader with the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric uh, AIDS Foundation. And so, pretty amazing, but it all started somewhere. It started, we, we all come from somewhere. 
and um, in Sue's case, uh, Reno, Nevada. Well, you were born in Napa, Napa Valley, but then uh, grew up in Reno. And can you tell a little bit for the group about your background and you know how you grew up and what your what your childhood and teenage years were like? <laughs> sure, I'd be happy to. And th thank you for that nice introduction. And thank you for. Uh, including me as the speaker tonight. Um, I, I find it, uh, I, I'm so happy to see the, the folks attending Socrates and so many young people because I, I often smile when someone introduces me as the CEO of Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and, uh, and then the next person I meet will say, oh, you know, you, you elites, mm -hmm. you, you probably, you know, born with a silver spoon, I think, well, there was some silver in the mines nearby in Nevada, but I was not born with a silver spoon. So I was born, uh, the first three kids in our family were born in Napa. I was born in uh, Napa, California. My dad worked in a pharmacy. Um, he's, he was born in San Francisco, and he relocated um, my mom with her three babies uh, and his buddy to Reno, Nevada yeah. to open up a family-owned drugstore. So I grew up uh, in Reno, Nevada. I went... Um, uh, to Catholic school there, went to eight years to Catholic school, and then went to high school. And then I went to University of Nevada, Reno, for undergrad and medical school. Yeah. Uh, so when I went to UC San Francisco as a medical intern uh, and met my husband, Nick, that was the first time I had ever lived outside of my parents' house. Yeah. <laughs> so I was not really an aggressive kid, yeah, that, except for at school. Well, I don't know. I, I, I don't know aggressive, but you sure were accomplished um, <laughs> because you graduated in three years from college while living at home and helping your family. Then went to med school and just think about that: going to medical school, living at home. Mm -hmm. your, your your little siblings um, and your parents must have sometimes wondered how you did it all. Right? You were probably on the run constantly. Yeah, it, one of the things that I'm really grateful for is um, being second of seven kids and having many younger brothers and sisters. I, I was a fierce student. I really loved learning and I loved science and loved medicine, um, but I had chores um, and had expectations and helping my mom was one of those expectations. And I think that kind of metered my passion for studying and doing all the homework. And it, it was, um, I, I think in the end, it was good for me, but it was also good to go away at yeah. some point. Yeah. So, so off you went then for your residency. Yes. Um, where you had on the first day, you met your future husband. Yes. Yep. <laughs> I did. <laughs> so I, I, uh, I, I was telling Dan a story that, um, that, that I've always loved. Uh, and, and people here, now there's a fancy word for this story. It's called imposter syndrome. Yeah. Anybody heard about that? So, so first day of this, uh, UC San Francisco in 82, when we showed up as interns, was the prime program in the, in the west of the United States. It was so hard to get into. And the, at a table of, of 24 residents, you go around the table, and everybody says, I'm... John, and I went to Harvard, and I'm Jane, and I went to UCSF, and I went to Yale. And, and so when my turn came, I was sort of like, you know, University of Nevada, Reno. Yes, there's a medical school there. And I, I read the same books as you, really, I did. Yeah. <laughs> like, I was just completely like thinking, I, I can never. And so the, the, the chain continues, and this extremely handsome, tall young man says, University of Kentucky, I say. <laughs> He's going to be my friend, uh, and he still is. <laughs> so we, we bonded over our small wow. state schools. Well, if on the one hand you might think, you know, you invoke the term imposter syndrome, another term that's used a lot in education today is grit, which Angela Duckworth calls the combination of passion plus persistence and resilience in, support of, in pursuit of goals. Sounds like that was you. I think gr grit for sure, yeah. <laughs> grit for sure, yeah. So that residency, and I'm taking time here because I think it's so important to get to know people as who they are and not just what we've accomplished. You know, so you're taking time, you're getting started, and you were right away working as a resident with, uh, with HIV AIDS patients. So if, if people remember back, and I'm sure most of you do, um, particularly people who were in um, uh, a big city, that um, HIV AIDS was first um, uh, talked about in uh, by our Centers for Disease Control in 1981. Yep. 
we went as internal medicine residents in San Francisco in 1982. Yeah. One of the areas, like LA, New York, and San Francisco, in the epicenter of, of this horrible, horrible new disease. And so, like our colleagues, um, Nick and I and our training was so heavily influenced by the AIDS epidemic and by having people our age yeah. have something that yeah. quickly killed them. Exactly. It was terrifying. Exactly. And I remember those, those times, too, and uh, uh, had some friends that had the illness, but also that the way that my wife Karen and I knew some people that were working with HIV AIDS patients, and we idolized them for being among the forerunners and breaking through all the prejudices in society, uh, as well as the fears of personal safety. Right? That, that, this isn't just things we're used to now. This was, there was so much fear around um, AIDS at that time. And did, did, was that something you had to work through? So I, uh, we had to work through, um, I, I think the best word for it is uncertainty. Yeah. We didn't know early on all the ways that HIV was transmitted. Um, we weren't sure, um, uh, at one point we were gowned and gloved. Yeah, we, exactly. we didn't know how to protect ourselves. Um, there, there was an enormous concern that we didn't know what would happen to the patients next. Yeah. Um, and so the, the disease was being described and understood as we were caring for the patients on yeah, the front lines. Exactly. And there was stigma associated with it. I became a specialist, so I'm a, a cancer doctor, I'm an oncologist, um, and I became a specialist in the cancers that AIDS patients get. Yeah. And the particular cancer that um, I specialized in was Kaposi sarcoma. And so, again, if you remember the AIDS epidemic, Kaposi sarcoma caused large purple spots. Um, and so if, if your family didn't know you were gay and your family didn't know you had HIV, if you had Kaposi sarcoma, your family knew. Yeah. Um, there was, it was very um, evident what was wrong. So, so particularly for my patients, I think the stigma associated with AIDS and the the challenges were even more challenging than, um, and uh, as I became an oncology fellow, that was the area that I worked yeah. in. It sounds like you were one of those like great serving kind that saw yourself treating the person and not simply treating the condition. Well, the I think that um, the training program that that I was really fortunate to be a part of, and one of the reasons I was so excited to go back as chancellor, it, it was, as hard as it was, it was a magical time for great teachers and great leaders in medicine. And so we had, from Holly Smith, our chief of medicine, who, who just passed, uh, to um, the chief residents, to the faculty, this was a time in medicine when people combined intellectual excellence with bedside manner. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, we're, we're, they used the Socratic method, actually. <laughs> They'd ask questions until you ran out of answers. And so it was tough. Yeah. Um, and there was nothing easy about the program, but there was just a sense of um, a combination, I think, of a sense of pride that you were learning so much about medicine, but it was in service of people who were struggling and suffering. Exactly, so then you and Nick took that to yet another level. Yeah. When uh, shortly after getting married, you went to Uganda for two years. And would you say a little bit about that experience? Yeah, so um, as I said, I went into oncology and went back to, to Berkeley and got a, a master's in public health because I wanted to learn more about statistics and epidemiology. Nick uh, um, uh, specialized in infectious diseases and went into an, an immunology lab, learning more about uh, the biology of immune function. And um, in 1988, Rockefeller Foundation came to UCSF and said, the world is getting more and more worried about heterosexual transmission of AIDS. We knew about uh, um, the, the, the really terrible epidemic amongst uh, gay men and hemophiliacs and, and uh, injection drug users were starting to learn about that. But what was happening in Africa seemed murky and mysterious. So um, uh, when Rockefeller approached UCSF, the UCSF loaned Nick and I as faculty members to Makere University in Kampala, Uganda yeah. in 1988. Uh, and we moved in early 89. And I'm smiling when I say that um, because I, I now know, I didn't know then, 
that the normal thing would be that you would have a global health program yeah. and infrastructure and people. Um, but we, we actually uh, um, just landed in the middle of Uganda not long after Idi Amin and uh, in a really tough time yeah. um, with roadblocks and stops and, uh, and no Department of Global Health at UCSF. Yeah. And so it was a, a profoundly life-changing experience yeah. and really tough experience. Yeah, and the disease was just wiping out people. Right? It, it, at the time we moved to Uganda, the, um, uh, there, were, there was one other uh, oncologist um, in Uganda, and, and I'm not a pediatric oncologist, so he took care of most of the kids in the cancer mm -hmm. ward, and I ran the adult cancer ward. Virtually 100% of the patients in the adult cancer ward had Kaposi sarcoma, this cancer associated with AIDS. Nick opened up the sexually transmitted disease clinic that had been closed during the war and the difficult times. And um, among 16-year-old girls who went to the STD clinic, it, half of those girls were infected yeah. if they had a sexually transmitted disease. Just the, the, the amount of disease and just how profoundly it was impacting society all the way back in 1989. You, you would drive along the road and see coffin makers. Just it, to, to go from San Francisco and what we had seen and how difficult it was we had been sort of steeled and really struggling with tough things for patients we cared for, but we were unprepared for this. Just the magnitude of the disease, the difficulty from people from all walks of life. Yeah. I'm sort of asking this for some of our Socrates students who are here as they sort of develop themselves for the next stages of their careers, the impacts they want to make. That just must have been so stunning, and you might have felt imposter syndrome in a different way Again, here you were in Africa, just the two of you, pretty much a few other people, with a whole world back here that maybe couldn't really connect with what you were doing. It was so much uncertainty and so much tragedy all around. Um, and just how did you process that experience? You know, I I think that the 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 challenge was how overwhelming yeah. everything felt. The good news was we were really well trained. Yeah. I mean, but we. I, I, then and now, I'm so grateful for having been a dedicated student and having such great teachers and opportunities to learn. So we rolled up our sleeves, and we knew for sure that what what had what was a research project was going to be a research and service project. We started teaching in the medical school. We, we, we went on rounds with the, the trainees because there were two, uh, their opportunities for learning were too limited, and we took care of patients. Yeah. We took care of patients every day. And um, the, the, the little medicine that we had, we stretched as far as it would stretch and did as much as we could for the patients who we were around. And we, we got to be extremely good friends and colleagues with our Ugandan colleagues yeah. and learned... Um, a, a lot about um, a, about what it was like to care for patients in the conditions that we found in Uganda. Yeah. And so to this day, we have friends who are Ugandan uh, physicians who we, we became their, their colleagues uh, in the years that we were there. I hope you'll consider writing a memoir at some point <laughs> and you know, really dig into that further. Um, so then you came back and I'm probably shortcutting a little bit, but after working in private practice, you then got involved in biomedical research again uh -huh. in a new way, and uh, quite a, you know quite a pivot really. Right. And um, uh, what was that? What, could you tell the audience what the pivot was and how you thought about making that change in your career? Well, the, it, it, I'll skip the part about the end of our academic careers because that's not the best part of the story, <laughs> but uh, it. Because there was no global health program, we really came back to, to not having a job uh, at University of California, which was, uh, um, uh, it, it took a lot of grit. That's all I'll say about that uh, part of our life. So we went into practice, and um, it's actually a great story. It's a great story for, for today's um, uh, partners, who often are two career families. Uh, when we were in practice, um, Nick was recruited to Bristol Myers Squibb to work on the second ever approved antiretroviral drug. Yeah. This was a time when AZT was the first yeah. and new ones were coming along. And so he told them he wouldn't come unless um, uh, I could come too. 
Um, and they said, okay, we have a nepotism rule. Um, and he said, fine, we'll, we'll stay where we are. Uh, and so they found an exception for their nepotism rule. <laughs> it's a true story. Um, and hired me begrudgingly. Um, uh, it's, it's not an exaggeration, um, but they got Nick and they hired me and they had this little tiny drug that had just gotten approved for ovarian cancer. And it, it, they were trying to get the drug approved for breast cancer. And they said, okay, she can't hurt anybody. We'll have her do drug safety on Taxol. And um, I'm smiling about it because when I, got, uh, when I got to work there and I was doing uh, drug safety on Taxol, one of the great assets I had is Nick and I had taught ourselves how to program in Uganda. You know, we didn't have movie or TVs. Yeah. What are you going to do? Um, so we could do some statistical programming. And the first time I talked to the statistician, he recognized that I knew how to do the programming he was doing. And he said, you don't get to do this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it yeah. was, but it was his first aha that, OK, maybe, she, she, maybe she's OK. Yeah. Maybe we'll put her to use. So I got to work on Texol, which was a brand new drug. And uh, the first year I was at Bristol-Myers Squibb, we got the approval for Texol for breast cancer in the US, and the second year in Europe. Yeah, amazing. So, so here you are now working on major drug development yeah. and yeah. a whole other way of having impact. Uh, it was. Right? It, it was Absolutely fantastic. I loved, and it's funny because if you'd have told me when I was in Reno, Nevada, or San Francisco, you're going to work at a drug company. Yeah. I said, you've lost your marbles. Yeah. There's no way I'm going to work at a drug company. Yeah. I don't know what they do, but I, you know, I'm suspicious they might wear a black hat, and I'm a white hat kind of gal. Yeah. You know, I'm like, yeah. I'm the, one yeah. of the good guys. And when I got there, I got to use the statistics I love to do. I got to use um, all the medicine I had learned, and I got to work on a brand new medicine for women with breast cancer. Yeah. It was it, it, with people who knew what they were doing, knew how to work in the regulatory system. Um, I loved yeah. it. What you just said is an advertisement for affordable public higher education. Think of what wouldn't be, exist today. <laughs> Yeah. It's not for, the, for what you experienced at University uh, of Nevada, really. Uh, the yeah. the, the uh, uh, pu public uh, higher ed and affordable public yeah. higher ed, man, I, yeah. I, I couldn't have said it better than you. Yeah. yeah. Well, you did say it better than me. I just summarized <laughs> it. <laughs> well, I'm a fan. I'm a fan. So, um, so just on this theme of cancer for a moment, is there anything that you're excited about right now in sort of the work being done in cancer uh, around the world or in the U.S. that you just want to share with the audience? Uh, if, for sure. The, so one of the things that was so fantastic about being at Bristol Myers Squibb is I got to work with the fathers. There weren't any mothers, but you know that changed over time. But the, the people who had really developed chemotherapy. And so in the 90s, we just thought you had to just be you know, so tough. We developed all these medicines for nausea and vomiting. And like, you know, you had to really be tough to, to kill a cancer yeah. cell. When I got to go to Genentech after uh, working at Bristol Myers Squibb and work on antibodies, we started to learn that the human immune system is a beautiful yeah. thing. Yeah. And so what I'm excited about now is that the newest ways of treating cancer, use your own body's immune system. And if the cancer signals your body to turn down your immune system, we now have medicines that say turn back up. Now, we need a rheostat on that. We need to know who will benefit. There's a lot to be worked out. But what a beautiful yeah. thing. Yep. You know, we, we use our own immune system to target other diseases. So these breakthroughs that are targeting the immune system in cancer yep. are a huge revolution. Yeah. And where is, and is, is, it, is it correct to call it immunotherapy, immuno, immunotherapy? Cancer immunotherapy, yeah. so, yes. So where is that work happening? Is it in, in, in academic medical centers? Is it in private sector, both? It's, it's both. A lot of it has started in academic medical centers yeah. because it requires a lot of, um, of high tech. And uh, um, it's almost, it, the er, some of the early parts of it, um, the risk benefit, monitoring the safety, some of the cellular therapy require a, a lot of like blood banking like capabilities or almost like a bone marrow transplant like capabilities. So early on, it's going to take a fair amount of infrastructure, but it's moving quickly, especially more of the, the injections yeah. that aren't cellular therapy. It's moving quickly to all um, large cancer centers. So you, here you are now helping to create and invent these new radically promising therapies. 
and the University of California, San Francisco recruits you uh, to become chancellor. And um, so, you know, it kind of it must have been surreal to step back <laughs> into the, the institution which you had left thinking, well, I'm done with UCSF. Um, it, what, what led you to make the change? Well, the, the, um, I, I had 14 fantastic years at Genentech yeah. and became president at Genentech. And it was, um, it was an experience I never thought I would have in my life. We made some important new medicines. I got to lead. I learned a lot about um, uh, business, yeah. which was a surprise for me, and liked business and liked uh, managing. And uh, um, we were the subject of, for the business people in the room, a squeeze out. I learned a new business term. A squeeze out means somebody buys you and you don't want them to buy you. Yeah. Um, and uh, so Roche bought the rest of Genentech. Yeah. And uh, in 2009, uh, UCSF called and asked if I would um, uh, interview to be chancellor. And um, so I became their ninth chancellor and their first female chancellor yeah. at UCSF. Yeah, pretty cool. Yeah. Pretty cool. <laughs> I, I want to ask you about, uh, since you mentioned you were the first female chancellor, about a big topic. You could hardly cover it in one answer, but the experience of women in science in our country. We, have we made progress, and what more do we need to do? I would say um, uh, it, yes, but. Yeah. Um, it, it, I've had a, a lot of discussions uh, at Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, both with the staff there but also because we do so much work, work in education, we have interns, we, we, I have a lot of opportunities to talk to young women. And what I realize in many ways is that the experience I've had, um, uh, in fact, somebody who I talked to called me a unicorn, which I've never been called before a unicorn. Um, having the kind of experience that I had growing up, um, it, just uh, thinking that anything was possible no matter what I wanted to do, yeah. that it was possible. Yeah. Having every door open for me, yeah. um, maybe I am a unicorn. Yeah. I think the reality for women in, um, in science, for women in the STEM fields, th there's two realities that make it really hard. One is right at the time people expect you to be the most productive are the time you want to start a family. Right. You want to have kids. You want to be with, uh, um, with, with your family. And so I think those... Those sorts of things are really important in figuring out how you stay in your field and how you work it out for you yeah. with whatever way works for you and your family is essential in doing that. But the other thing is there's just unconscious bias. Exactly. And I don't think people mean anything by it. Um, but it's to this day, uh, uh, apparently I don't look like a CEO. <laughs> you know, it's just... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a man um, to start with. No, there's just a, um, I, and, and I, I have a, uh, um, I'm kind of a wisecracker. You know, I, I like to use my sense of humor. Um, and so I, I give people the benefit of the doubt. But it's so funny if somebody, um, if I talk to somebody and they startle if they hear, oh, you're chancellor or you're CEO. And, and I think one time in my life it'd be nice for somebody not to startle. It, you know, I mean, it's just, it's, and, and, and for men, that never happens. Yeah. And so I just think there's just a little bit, um, a little bit more overhead yeah. um, that comes when you're a woman because you're unusual. And um, things are just built for a guy in a lot of the jobs I've had. Yeah, well, uh, you know, a lot of the women that I know in science talk about a, a number of different glass ceilings or at least um, sort of you know, unconscious or conscious biases, part in the, in the biomedical industrial complex, part in the world of finance, yeah. and part in the world of tech. And you, we need all those three to work together. Right. So we should put those three plus gender, yeah. and we'll be able to solve a lot of problems, won't we? Yeah, you know, I, I also have to say that the, um, the thing that I encourage young women and young men, um, because I'm, I'm mm -hmm. nervous all the time, that the most talented students will, will no longer go into science yeah. and medicine. I mean, being a physician is hard work. Yeah. It takes so many years of training. And if you specialize in certain subspecialties, it's extra years of training on top of medical school and residency and, uh, and learning how to do procedures or, or uh, the like. 
the, the thing that I would say is I've worked really hard in my career, and, and Nick and I have both had just this amazing experience um, living around the world and, and moving around. Uh, not for one minute would I ever regret having become a physician. Yeah. It, it is the most special thing in the world is when you think that you can use your talents and skills and your intellect um, so that other people benefit. Uh, you know, when I got to work on Herceptin, the breast cancer drug, uh, I remember like it was yesterday, the day that drug was approved. And I thought about every single woman who I knew had been struggling, who would get that drug, yeah. and thought, if I, you know, it's a yeah. huge team, it's a ton of people. If I had this much to do with it, uh, you know, you could put it on my right. headstone That's what life's someday. about. Exactly. And now, if I get to work with my colleagues at the Gates Foundation, and somebody's baby doesn't have to worry about malaria, and we get rid of polio for the whole world, and no one has to worry about polio anymore, I feel the same yeah. way. So. For all the young people, it's a great life to be in medicine and life sciences. I mean, the impact of what you do and the human impact is magnificent. Yeah. Let me ask you a question or two about the Gates Foundation. So you've been the president now for, and CEO for about four years. Four years, yeah. And um, what would you like the audience to know about what the Gates Foundation is prioritizing right now? Well, it, you know, you, you asked me as we were walking up here about leaving UCSF and moving to the Gates yeah. Foundation. And so I would want the, um, the audience to know why I made that change. Yeah. Because I actually was, I was reluctant. I'm, I was all in at UCSF. If you've seen Mission Bay and some of the wonderful things that are happening in San Francisco, you would know how exciting the research enterprise, the yeah. clinical enterprise, the teaching, it, it's all fantastic. The thing that I love about working with Bill and Melinda, and the thing I'm grateful to Warren Buffett about, because this is the three of them are the trustees. Yeah. Um, that's who I work for. Those are my three bosses. The, the beautiful thing about them is the scale of their ambition. So it isn't just that they're generous, and they are generous, it's amazing, but they're ambitious. Yeah. And if you're government, you know, if, if you're in a in private industry, so I, I've told people who asked me about the difference in my job. So at Genentech, I had to make money. You know, the shareholders didn't like it if we didn't make money. They, they, we had our quarter calls, and there was expectations. At UCSF, I had to raise money. You, you know, I, I had to raise money. So this is a job where I don't have to make money. I don't have to raise money. So guess what that means? No excuses. Yeah. No excuses, and, and no excuses with a scale of ambition yeah. that is literally to change the world, yeah. to, to get rid of poverty, to make the diseases that differentially affect poor people, things like polio, things like AIDS and malaria and tuberculosis and diarrheal diseases and what we call neglected tropical diseases. Nobody should get those diseases. Yeah. So, so what I love most about working at the foundation, um, and I'm talking about global health, there's other things that we do, the, the scale of the ambition and the scale of the generosity, it's, it's still small given the ambitions, but we should make a big difference. Yeah. And we have no excuses. Yeah. So on any given day, I'm terrified, which I really like. That's yeah. good. <laughs> but I also get to work with incredibly talented people who are experts on all of these things uh, and, and many more, nutrition, family planning. Um, but what I like most is that that ambition and that wish that the generosity make it possible for people to live a healthy and productive life and, and to have an equity agenda, it's for real. Yeah. Sometimes people worry about big philanthropy or big business mm -hmm. or big anything, big higher education. Right. That the agenda that let it be big somehow is about sustaining its bigness. Yeah. I'm sure you've thought about that and probably talked about it with your bosses. Yeah. How, how do you think about the, how do you respond to some of the people that are cynical or worried that the yeah. major philanthropic organizations in this country, and by no means just Gates, are somehow developing an agenda too inclusive, not, not inclusively enough? I right. Guess. Yeah, no, I even heard big, big biotech. That's yeah, when I knew yeah. we were in trouble. Yeah. Um, big not being a, a word that people use uh, fondly. I, I think it's actually really good for people to push us. Yeah. I do think when you're in philanthropy, 
um, the, the tradition in the United States to be tax exempt is based on a sense that philanthropy should be giving back, right. there, that there should be a return on that investment. And so more than just the, the required payout to keep your tax exempt status, I welcome people giving us feedback. I think that's good and healthy for us. Um, what, what I will say is even though the, the Gates Foundation is the largest private foundation in the world, and it's a lot of money, um, it, it'll be uh, around $5 billion spent um, in charitable uh, expenses this year. Given the scale of the problems, it's small. Yeah. Um, but the most important thing that I think we are better at now and need to keep getting better at is our listening skills. Um, I'll give you an example. So uh, Ethiopia, we've worked in Ethiopia at Gates Foundation for a long time. They've had a lot of challenges. They've had a lot of hunger challenges, but they've had a lot of uh, maternal, neonatal, and child health challenges. And we worked incredibly successfully with Ethiopia for a number of years. Last year, the government of Ethiopia decided they didn't want all of these um, external groups, whether it's USAID or Gates Foundation or some of the Europeans, to come into Ethiopia and say, oh, we have a new program for you in malaria, or we have a new program for you on uh, maternal health. They decided that through their Ministry of Health and their planning process, they would outline their health systems transformation agenda. And then they gathered all of us and they said, here's our agenda. If you're willing to be part of it, then we'll work with you. Exciting. Perfect. That's how it should be. That's exactly. Their, exactly. It's their country. Yeah. It's their citizens. They're accountable for their citizens. And I saw it as a sign of their maturation. Exactly. Yeah. And it, for me, it was tremendously exciting. It turned upside down everything we yeah. did, as it yeah, should. As it should. And now they are driving their health agenda, their health transformation. And we are, when we can, especially in the area of innovation and R&D, if there's a new anti-malarial that makes our life easier, if there's a new vaccine, but that's a much better role for philanthropy, whether it be big or small, yeah, congratulations. to be playing. Congratulations. Yeah. So I want to ask you three questions about yourself, and then uh, we have a surprise for the audience. <laughs> uh, so. Um, and this is, again, in the spirit of um, your values and the audience, the group here, the Socrates students, getting a chance to think a little bit about what they can learn for their own futures about, you know, from your life story. So the first question I have is just what keeps you grounded? Uh, <laughs> if you're grounded. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I have a lot to be grounded about. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I would say the most important uh, um, thing that keeps me grounded is a combination of two things. One is family. Uh, so Nick and I are a, a, a family of two for a long time, but he's one of seven and I'm one of seven, like Jim Crown. All, all one of sevens are, are really great. And we have two fantastic families. Yeah. Um, my family will tell me every time I'm stupid. Yeah. And they do it as much as yeah. possible. <laughs> so, so family, uh, Nick and family. And then the other thing is I, I love um, being outside. Yeah. I love being here at Aspen. You know, I grew up not far from Lake Tahoe. Yeah. And so for me, getting outside and doing anything, whether it's skiing, hiking, um, biking, uh, uh, that, that makes me happy. Yeah. So second question is, I was just listening to your career. It's so interesting to me how you constantly changed sectors. You, I don't think you stayed in the same sector twice. You kept moving, you know, this to this to this to this. And that's bold um, because you have to learn everything mm -hmm. all over again. So any thoughts about that as part of the way you've chosen to create your career and to move from you know, private to, uh, to higher education to foundation work just that way? Yeah. Well, maybe two comments on that. The, fir the first thing is there is one thing I really love. I love managing. Yeah. Um, and uh, when I was at Genentech, I had, um, it was actually a an argument. Um, I think I won, but actually the other guy thought he won. Um, we were arguing about management training. 
and uh, the, the corporate counsel who I, to this day, adore, and I were fighting about who had to take management training. And he said, well, look, if, a, if one of my lawyers just has a legal assistant or a patent assistant, they don't have to take management yeah. training. And I started pounding my fist on the table and said, every employee deserves a great manager. Yeah. Like, you can't have, like, that assistant, their boss opt out on management training. Everyone deserves a great manager. And apparently, <laughs> this got out. Yeah. And uh, so at Genentech, I was known for yeah. saying everyone deserves a great manager. And I decided I could not say that and not be a great manager myself. Yeah. So I worked really hard on being a great manager. And then when I went to UCSF, they're like, you're in academia now. Yeah. you got to get over that. Yeah. <laughs> I said, no, no, no. Even, and maybe even yeah. especially, especially in a big academic medical center, if you don't know what you're signed up for or get feedback, that seems weird to me. Yeah. Um, and now at Gates Foundation, the same thing. Everyone deserves a great manager. And part of that is thinking with people about what they're signed up for, what they learn every year. And I've always said to people who I manage, what's going to happen this year so you'll be better at the end of this year than you are at the start of this yeah. year? What are you going to learn? What new skill? What are you going to develop? And part of that is something that I think really I love. I love learning. Yeah. And, and I think when you change sectors, there's, um, there's a lot of humility, I can tell you that, because you're not the smartest person in the room. And it's not like, this is the way we do it. Um, and so I think it's part of me thinking, um, I also want to be on the other side of building my capabilities and skills. And I think it makes me a better leader and manager. Yeah that I can see other people taking risks and hope they pay off for them. I, I think it's so impressive the way you talked about being in Uganda. You, what, what could you go fall back on in, in essentially in a whirlwind that you had gotten good at medicine, you had gotten yeah. good. And now, I was a good doctor. Right, you got good, and now <laughs> yeah. as, a, as a leader, you have to get good at management. That's, yeah. that's really good advice for everybody here. Get, you wanna make an impact, get good. Make the effort, get good. Yeah. Okay, so one more question. Um, uh, there are a lot of people in this room are change makers and are thinking about making new changes in the world, and you've made a lot of change and helped a lot of people. Do you have any ad just, you know, advice for change makers? Oh, gosh. Yeah, I, you know, I, I love innovation and I love change, probably to a fault. Um, but, but I think it's, it's wonderful. Probably uh, the advice that, that I give myself and I would give to others is, to dream big dreams yeah. um, and, and understand what you'll do if you're wrong. It's, it's part of what I learned as a product developer in, in pharma and biotech. Yeah. Like you always want, you don't want your new drug to save lives, right? You, you want somebody who's sick or suffering, you want to prevent something bad from happening, and, but not all bets pay off. Yeah. And so I think that, that the thing that I love making things better. I love changing up so people have a better life. And I'm more humble now and experienced to know that when you're wrong, knowing that you might be wrong, your hypothesis might be wrong, and being ready for that yeah. so that the people who you're trying to serve don't suffer yeah. when you're wrong. Thank you so much. What a great answer. Thank you so much. <laughs> So, so Sue and I were talking, and we were thinking, here we are, this great evening in this majestic place with all these interesting people, and we have uh, Justice Breyer here. And how could we not put an extra chair on the stage for a moment uh, and ask Justice Breyer to join us just for a second so that all of you could have the chance, if you weren't there earlier today, to hear his talk. Speaking of dreaming big, getting to sit next to Justice Breyer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was so good. Really Thank good. you. So, uh, so apologies for the cold call. You probably did that to your students every now and then in class. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I thought I'd ask you just for a moment, just, um, just kind of out of the blue. Um, you know, we all know you're a great Supreme Court justice, but what do you do besides that? What? I used to bicycle until I lost my arm here. Uh, I, uh, no, I thought this was a great talk. I read quite a lot. You read? Yeah. So, what, so what are you reading right now? Well, I, I just finished. Uh, <laughs> I'm reading right now a book uh, called by Ford Maddox Ford called Parade's End. 
Yeah. He's a very, very good English writer in the 20s and about World War I. And uh, people thought that this book would be the great book of the 20th century. And maybe it is, but it's a hard going. Uh, then I just, <laughs> I, just <laughs> finished, I just finished Eric's book. Yep. Uh, Eric oh, yes, yes. <laughs> That is, uh, the book is Madison Park, if you don't I have was it. going to say that. Yes. <laughs> and now, moreover, I think it's a warm, lovely, it's a lovely book. Just a lovely book. And, and I guarantee you will like it. Yeah. And uh, uh, so I, I enjoyed that. And uh, then I read uh, Stu Eisenstadt's book about Jimmy Carter, yeah. very a little long, 900 pages. So anyway, but there we are. They're interesting pages. <laughs> and the, the other book that I've recently read is your field, in a sense. I sympathize with your field. I mean, I, I have partly that of medical, medical part. Now, what's that? Which I book? I mean, cancer. Now, the book that I've read uh, is called When Your Child is Very Sick. Ah. And, uh, <laughs> yes. And so I know this world. Do, do you know and, uh, the I author? I think it's a great book. <laughs> I think it's a great book. Uh, it is. I, I think it's a great book because I've read what people in your field and others have said about it. Uh, I think it is a great book. Because uh, when you have this problem with your child, it is a problem. Yeah. And not everybody lives yeah. in New York. And not everybody lives in uh, Boston near Dana-Farber. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And not everybody mm -hmm. lives uh, down near uh, DHN Anderson. And uh, they don't know what to do. And they should know. And they should know what's going to happen. And they should know how they treat the doctors, how they treat what, they, what, what counts, uh, and uh, what do they say to the school. And most kids get better, uh, but there is a lot of uh, care after that, and right hand in glove with you. Yeah. And there is happen to be another reason I like this book, but I discount that. And that's because it was written by my wife. <laughs> 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 and she, she has worked in your world. She's worked at Dana-Farber uh, for more than 25 years with the parents. That's who, great. Uh, have these children and with the children. And uh, she knows about the puppets, and she knows about how they're all different, but she knows about what to say when, in fact, they're having trouble with their medicine, and she knows uh, what to, when they survive, and how those few who don't, yeah. uh, how, uh, what's to be said, how do you do it uh, with parents that are different. And uh, it, it's, it's, it's very good for me, a lawyer, to be married to a psychologist. <laughs> <laughs> and it's very good for me when I know and I say, I'd just like to tell you about my day. I know the answer might be, let me tell you about my day. <laughs> yeah, yep. exactly. And, and so right. I hope you get interested in this book. And it's I hope a, Gates does it. I, I, I hope better those read millions that book. of people, I better read yeah, that book. <laughs> those millions of women and men who have those children. They and, should definitely and, read it. Yeah. I agree. Okay. There we are. So, uh, so Justice. <laughs> you Breyer, asked. <laughs> uh, Justice Breyer, you, you went to a lot of trouble to get here to speak uh, earlier today in our McCloskey Lecture Series, and it was a wonderful opportunity for us to hear your reflections uh, under the penetrating questions of Joshua Johnson. And I just would wonder um, if you have thoughts about the ASP Institute and um, what you value about the place, and if you have any thoughts or hopes for what we might do with our resources and our moment to make a difference for our country and our world. No, I started the first time I think I was here. I remember hearing about it from Abe Shays, who was a professor yeah. at the law school at Harvard, yeah. years and years ago. And uh, then it was mostly about music, Aspen. Uh, but then I first came here in 1987. Mm -hmm. Harry Blackman was uh, uh, in that seminar about law and justice that Merle Chertoff is running now. And I've come uh, quite a few times after that, and each time I learn something. And I learn something I'm not, I, you know, I, I, I don't feel I want to go, I want to go into a, 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 a seminar on foreign affairs or educating children or what's going on in the medical world. And I hear people and they're talking, and they know what they're talking about, and they're thoughtful, and they have ideas. That's what it's called, uh, one of the festivals. And uh, they're dispassionately, in a sense, in that they don't get overly emotional, but they're motivated, <laughs> and they're driving towards something better. And those seminars go on and on and on, and everyone is, they're great. Yeah. And you bring these students here, and they see that everything is not a fight, that quite a lot of the world is a dispassionate effort to find out what will work better in a world that's very complicated, and people have disparate ideas. So the more you do that, the better I like it. Yeah. Thank I'm you. selfish Thank about you. it, but Thank I hope you, you continue. Thank you. Yeah. 
Sue Desmond Hellman, Stephen Breyer, two American Giants. Thank you so much for being here.